I always find biblical names to be very interesting, right? Some are the most unique names throughout Scripture. We have Ahaz in our first reading from Isaiah. Uh, some of my personal favorite, though, if you've ever read the book of Hosea, Hosea marries someone, uh, his wife, her name is Gomer. Sounds more like an insult than a name. And then Hosea and Gomer, they actually have three children. Jezreel, a little bit more normal. Uh, and then she conceives again and, bore, and uh, bears a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name not pitied, for I will no more have pity on the house of Israel. Right? Oftentimes it's always a play on words. My personal favorite, uh, when she had weaned not pity, she conceived and bore a son. So this is the third child. And the Lord said, call his name not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God, right? I thought that would be much more funny. <laughs> not my people, right? Names, names signify something. Names mean something. It's important that you know what your name means. I remember when I did my first baptism ever. I was a deacon uh, at a different parish. Don't try to figure out how these, who these people are. Uh, I was at a different parish as a deacon, and when I was there, my very first baptism, it was May of 2020, this family uh, wasn't the, the most church-going family, and there was uh, four generations of people there. So I was baptizing a little boy, and then mom was there, grandma was there, and then great-grandma was there. And uh, I remember there comes a point in the baptismal rite where you ask, what name do you give your child? And then the parent is, uh, is supposed to respond with the name that they have given their child. So I said, what name do you give your child? And mom looks at me, and she stares at me, and she stares at me. I'm like, are you going to answer ever? <laughs> she keeps looking at me. And uh, finally, uh, I ask her again, what name do you give your child? And she looks at uh, great-grandma, and great-grandma goes, well, I've always loved the name Jesus. <laughs> so it turned out there was a little bit of argument in the, in the uh, family what they were supposed to baptize this little child as. So uh, it was a good learning experience for me. Uh, I didn't know, but apparently baptismal certificates are a legal document. So baptismal certificates are supposed to match your baptismal name. Learn that one the hard way. So... Uh, but we wound up baptizing him as Jesus, a little uh, uh, Hispanic family. So names are important, right? You should baptize your child with a Christian name, and uh, names are very important. All that to say, right, today in our readings, we hear about Jesus' name twice, two times. First from Isaiah, and then the Gospel of Matthew quotes it again. You shall name him what? You shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. Brothers and sisters, tonight's reflection is twofold. First and foremost, Emmanuel, God is with us. And secondly, we're preaching about the Eucharist this weekend. The Eucharist as the sacrament of charity. But first and foremost, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. This is the great echo during uh, Advent, but especially the Christmas season. We finally have our decorations up just in time for Christmas, right? Pretty soon, Jesus will be in the manger here. God will come. God is with us. You see, it's not just enough for God to be up in, in the heavens, up in heaven, uh, directing um, life, directing the world from above. He wants to be in our mess. He wants to be with us, and so he comes as a baby. He comes as a human. And even that's not enough. He humbles himself so much to the point where he becomes a piece of bread. God becomes man so that man might become like God. And God becomes a piece of bread gives himself to us in his flesh so that he might be even more so with us. 
Emmanuel, God is with us. This week concludes the last week of our preaching series in the Archdiocese. So where have we been? Over the last four or five weeks, we've been talking about charity, right? So the first week, what is charity? Charity at its most simplest form, right? Charity is friendship with God. We desire to be friends with God. We desire to know him. We desire to become friends with him. The next week, we looked at, well, what are the enemies of charity? What prevents us? What are the obstacles of being God's friend? Sloth, envy, and pride are the primary enemies against charity, against friendship with God. And then we asked the question, why are we talking about charity anyways? Why is charity so important? You see, charity is important because it's the essence of holiness. Without charity, we're dead. We could do all the right things, but if we don't do it through love, there's really no point in doing it. Charity gives us that great flame to kindle our good actions. Last week, we then looked at, well, what are the fruits of charity? When I'm friends with God, what flows from that? And the fruits of charity, right, are joy, peace, and mercy. That when I'm uh, God's friend, when I seek his friendship, when I seek to love God above all things and my neighbor as myself, naturally I'm joyful, I have peace, and I desire to receive and give mercy. And tonight the topic is, well, what is the sacrament of charity? It's the climax. You see, we're in this Eucharistic revival right now. The bishops of the United States have called for all Catholics in the U.S. to revive our desire, revive our knowledge for the Eucharist. Sadly, a lot of Pew studies, the Pew research studies, are showing that more and more Catholics, good Catholics, who go to Mass every week, don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. So the bishops have launched the Eucharistic, Eucharistic revival that we might be revived to once again believe in the true presence here at the altar. God's body, blood, soul, and divinity made present to us. One thing that I think is really cool, I don't know how this is going to work yet, uh, but I think it's going to be incredible, is in 2024, there's going to be a big Eucharistic Congress uh, on this, where all the Catholics in the U.S. are going to be invited to go. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be ticketed. It might get a little crazy, right? Uh, but that'll be in Indianapolis in 2024. Prior to that, what the bishops are wanting to do is do a Eucharistic procession from all four corners. So from Maine, Florida, California, and Oregon, there's going to be four Eucharistic processions that all end in Indianapolis on that day uh, when, when the Eucharistic revival begins that conference. So I don't know what it will look like yet. They're still planning it, but uh, can you imagine this? Like, we'll be walking from here to the next parish, and then that parish will take all their parishioners, and they'll walk to the next parish, and so forth and so forth, until eventually you end in Indianapolis. So thankfully, there's parishes that are close to us. We don't have to walk very far. <laughs> but won't this revive our desire for the Eucharist? God is with us. There's three points I want to push uh, or preach on tonight with regards to the Eucharist. The Eucharist as sacrifice, the Eucharist as presence, and the Eucharist as communion. Sacrifice, presence, communion. First and foremost, the Eucharist is a sacrifice. It's not a meal. We often think of, oh, I'm coming to Mass, I just get to receive something. But it's so much more. It's a partaking of a sacrifice that happened 2,000 years ago. That every time Mass is celebrated, redemption is at work. 
Because what happens here on this altar is a representation of what happened on Calvary 2,000 years ago. That God poured out his blood for you and for me. And this is why, right, this is why we all face the same direction at Mass. Because it reminds us that we're all facing the Lord together. That God who comes to dwell with us here, a sacrifice happens. That we together, we offer, right, may our sacrifice be acceptable. We offer to God the Father that sacrifice of Jesus Christ laying down his life for you and for me. The Eucharistic prayers speak all about this language. Today I'll pray uh, the third Eucharistic prayer, and there's a line that says this in it. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. May this sacrifice advance the peace and salvation of all the world. You see, what happens at every Mass, this perfect sacrifice helps accomplish redemption in the world, in our lives, that peace may be abundant. And this is why it's perfect right after the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we're sent out. Go, go forth, the Mass has ended, to bring what you have just received to those who you meet. the Eucharist. God is with us. God is made with us here through the sacrifice that we offer to him. The Eucharist as presence. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. I'll come back to that point in a minute. But then lastly, Eucharist as communion. Sacrifice, presence, and communion. Through the Eucharist, God wants to espouse himself to us. That we become, we, we, we share in the same union through this communion. You see, it wasn't just enough for God to come among us. He wants to be inside of us, to dwell in our very core. Married couples, you understand this better than anyone else. God just doesn't want to be among us. He wants to be inside of us. It's a physical and spiritual union that the two may become one flesh, that when we receive his presence, the body, blood, soul, and divinity, it transforms us. You become what you eat. And this union transforms us, once again, to go, that God is with us, and that we then we're able to bring him to others whom we meet. The Eucharist a sacrifice, presence, and communion. St. Paul, in the letters to the Romans today, has a very interesting line. He talks about the obedience of faith. And I want to close with this point tonight. The obedience of faith. You see, sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we struggle to believe the faith. Sometimes we, sh we struggle to believe, God, where are you? God, are you actually present here in the Eucharist? You say you are, the church says you are, uh, but I don't experience it that way. God, where are you? I remember when I got ordained and I celebrated my very first Mass. It took a lot more faith within me to now believe that when I, the priest, 
says those words. This is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. It took me to have a lot more faith to believe, how could God give me the power to say those words? It's not all of a sudden these holy priests anymore. Monsignor Ken Leone, it's not these people uh, who I really look up to and who I know who are holy. They can have that faith. But now me, as a priest, Lord, help me to believe. Because sometimes this just looks like a piece of bread. It tastes like a piece of bread. When we struggle to believe, when we struggle, uh, or maybe when we have certain doubts, that's precisely where we need the obedience of faith. To be obedient to the faith handed down to us from Jesus through the apostles passed on generation to generation. To be obedient to that faith. That, Lord, when I struggle to believe, I put my obedience in you. I trust that you are a good God. I trust that you are revealing to me the truth. Whenever we give ourselves in obedience to something, you will fall deeper in love with it. And so for those people who might struggle to believe, maybe in the Eucharist, maybe in another hard teaching of the church, I invite you to surrender in obedience to the faith of the church. When you give yourself in obedience to something, you will fall deeper in love with it. God is with us. God is with us here. He wants to be our friends. He wants to be your friends. The Eucharist is the sacrament of charity because Jesus gives himself to us body, blood, soul, and divinity. Jesus, as we approach the altar today, help us to receive this Eucharist as if it's our first, our last, and our only time that we ever get to receive you. And may, through this reception of the Holy Eucharist, may it transform us to be more like you. May you be in us and may you be with us.